What's up, everyone? Good morning. Welcome to City Beach Church in New Kensington. If you're new here, I want to welcome you personally. My name is Anthony. I'm the lead pastor. And, uh, man, if you don't have a home church, we would love to be that for you. You know, because this life is hard enough. You know, we all need people to walk through it with us. So I just want to welcome you. If there's anything you need, feel free to reach out to me, my wife, or anyone here. We're like a family. You know, we, we love each other here, and we are so happy that you've chosen to come here today. Uh, my message this morning is called Be the Message. You know, because a lot of people talk the talk, but how many people are really walking the walk? You know what I mean? If you're a Christian and a follower of Jesus Christ, your life should be your testimony. You don't need to, you know, say all these fancy words. But if, if you're in Christ, man, you should have his love pouring out of you. So how many know, man, he doesn't just fill our cup up a little bit, but he wants our cup to be overflowing. You know, um, he wants you to be the soul of the earth, man. He wants you to make people thirsty for what you have. So how many know it's a special thing to have Jesus in your life? And I'm going to give you a disclaimer. If this is your first time, sometimes I get really excited when I talk about Jesus because he's taken me from a lowly drug dealer, my wife from a crack cocaine addict. Man, and he's put our feet upon the rock of salvation. Man, he set us free in every way a human being could be liberated. And let me tell you, I believe Jesus has something like that for you, too. So this is our new sermon series we're going to be doing over the next couple months. It's called Be the Message. And it's all about empowering people. Because let me tell you, man, whenever I first met Jesus, I didn't think I could serve God. I was one of those guys that had that phobia that if I'd walk into a church, I'd be struck by a bolt of lightning. Well, that's how I thought. You know, and... Um, my friend invited me to go to church one day, and he started telling me about this pastor named Brian Holt. He was like, yeah, this guy was a heroin addict, and he got shot in the face. I'm like, well, if there's any church I might be safe walking into, that might be the church. I might be able to dodge a bolt there. And how many know his name was Brian Bolt? I dodged the lightning bolt, but I, I was sucked in by Brian Bolt. <laughs> empowering people because from the very first day I walked in he goes you know what Anthony God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise you know and God has a plan for your life Amen. you know he didn't save you just to desert you but he saved you so that you can be a toll in his toll belt Ooh. how good is that man God does not call the equipped but he equips the call oh, that's, right. that's the God we serve so even if you feel like you have no purpose on this earth believe me I was there Jesus Christ brings purpose to everything in life. You know, he has something special for you. But what I want to do is I want to take a minute to brag on someone right now. And I'm actually going to be tag team preaching with Pastor Nate today. And God is doing an awesome work in his life. You know what I mean? I'm so honored, you know, that he's here, that I've been able to empower him because he's reaching people. You know what I mean? We just started this youth group. And so many kids are coming to know Jesus. These are kids that don't go to church. You know, these are kids. If you've ever seen Beyond Scared Straight on TV, these are the type of kids we're reaching. And, man, he's telling them that Jesus loves them, that he's a plan for their life. And, man, he, he's, he's, he's growing God's kingdom. So if you please just give Pastor Nate a crazy wild welcome. I'm so excited for him to preach today. from Africa, man. I remember that fireball. I burned my hand on it. <laughs> um, well, good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Nate. Morning. I'm still not really, I'm still not used to calling myself that. <laughs> Sounds really weird. Um, well, um, just to give you a quick overview, I was kind of the opposite of Anthony. I didn't think if I walked into a church I'd be struck dead, but then again, I grew up in church, and um, I kind of lost my respect for God after some of the stuff I went through. Uh, parents got divorced, got addicted to drugs. I became a really horrible person. So if there was anybody that in this world people thought would never be saved, never be a Christian, I was probably that guy. I was that guy, um, I would scare people just because, like, something would be really horrible going on, 
and I look extremely calm, cool, and collected. And these were people that were trying to hurt me, looking at how calm I was, and then they'd end up pretty badly hurt, usually in the hospital. Um, yeah. I usually fought with my intellect instead of my brawn, like brute strength. Um, but I was just a very, very evil character. Um, so you want to talk about God flipping somebody? How many people here know me? Can I get a show of hands? How many people would say I'm a nice person? Well, hey Glenn, you're the only smart one. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn's my mentor. I thank God for him every day. He's teaching me how to be a man of God. It's something I'm really not used to. Um, these kids that we're reaching in the youth group, one of the reasons that I can reach out to these kids is because I know where they're coming from. I lived that life. I walked that walk. And truth be told, I don't want to see a single one of them have to go through half of the stuff I went through. Um, if we can pull them out of that miry clay right now, thank God. And really, because how do you change a city? Think about it. You reach the youth. God wants to change the city. You got to start with the generation that's about to become adults. You got to start there with the kids, the young adults, because then you have a generation that is now living for God. And what are they going to do? They're going to teach their kids to live for God. Yes. This is an advantage that really I didn't have. My dad was a pastor. My mom was a worship leader. They never taught me how to live for God. In fact, they taught me how to, you know, well, my dad taught me how to take a punch. <laughs> um, my mom, she kind of lost her marbles along the way. But in Sunday, like when it came to Sunday, they were the perfect couple. Everything was fine, everything was dandy. Nobody knew what was going on at home. So I, I really thank God for City Reach. No offense, Pastor Anthony, but if Pastor Brian Will walked up to me the first time I walked in City Reach and God said God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, I'd have probably punched him. <laughs> oh, what's that? What are you doing? Calling me a fool? <laughs> So, <laughs> thank God that uh, he didn't do that. But when I did walk into Northside Church for the first time, and I met Pastor Brian Bull. I wasn't greeted the way I was, ex you know, expecting to be greeting uh, a pastor. In fact, I didn't even know he was a pastor at first. I thought he was a greeter. <laughs> I really did because the dude just walked up to me. So nice to see you here in church. Gives me a big old hug. Just loves on me as soon as I walk in the door. It's like, oh. Well, they got a nice greeter here anyways. I wonder what the pastor's yeah. like. <laughs> and then I see him up on, like, behind the pulpit. It's like, wait a second. That's the pastor? <laughs> Since when do pastors do that? Um, but through my time in City Reach, um, I actually went through their men's home. Thank God for that. Um, it helped me get over a drug addiction. It helped me. It, um, I was led to Christ in that men's home. Um, right afterwards, I went to ministry school because of the connections that they had. Oh, and here's one for you. I started ministry school. There wasn't even a penny to my name. God paid every dime of that for me. Amen. Not one cent came out of my pocket. So if you think God doesn't use the... Because now I'll admit, I was a fool. And the reason I say that, I thought God didn't care about me. I thought he hated me, just, eh, I'd go away. No. He was watching over me every step of the way. I could count probably about 20 times that I know of. I should have been dead. God spared my life. <laughs> Several of those times I was trying to take it. Um... Then he sent me over to Africa where I got to burn my hand. <laughs> um, I got to see great things there. Uh, God just killing people. Pastor Anthony, he's seen them too. Um, Africa really opened my eyes. 
it made me see how real this thing is because I saw people sitting there who were demon possessed manifesting in the middle of Johannes Armitage or preaching. And we're carrying these people to the tents, watching the demons be cast out of them, praying for people, seeing them healed. And something I'll say, even if you're not called to be a missionary, go on at least one mission trip. It will change your life. Amen. It will make you see how real this fight we are Amen. in is. Amen. And truthfully, the mission field, that's the front lines. In America, we have so much church that people see across, it's like, oh yeah, that's just a church, it's just God. But truthfully, those people need God more. Because they think they're okay. Heck, drug addicts think they're okay sometimes. I know, I thought I was okay. Anthony, my friend, when you were a drug addict, did you think you were okay? Yeah. See, um, something I've learned now the hardest battle you're going to fight is to make somebody who thinks they're okay realize they're not. Um, it's actually much easier when they realize they're not okay and they ask for help. Um, uh, quick testimony, I got to see some old friends of mine yesterday at my brother's wedding. And I remember right after I got saved, the same dude, Andrew, um, I went over his house, and he hadn't seen me in like three, four months at that time. Uh, and he's sitting there trying to push drugs and alcohol on me. I'm like, no, dude, I don't want to do that. I'm like, man, I remember you. You're the guy that goes around beating people up, smoking weed all the time, drinking all the time. Come on, man, you ain't fooling me. You ain't fooling nobody. You're going to cut off this good boy act after a while. Oh, lo and behold, he realizes now it wasn't an act. Right. <clears throat> I mean, God will literally take the worst person in the world and flip them around and make them the best person. And it has nothing to do with anything we do. It's all God. It's all Jesus. This is what Jesus does. Jesus is in the business of saving lives. I mean, can't somebody get excited about that? Think about all the people in your life. All your, your loved ones, all your friends, all your family that need Jesus. He can save them. Can't somebody get excited about that? Woo! Yeah. Pastor Anthony? Good stuff, Nate. Right. I gotta be honest, he just got me fired up. Yeah. I'm, I might run a lap or something, because if not, and I, I think the Holy Ghost is about to jump up out of me. So, in this series, this is going to be our memory verse. By the, by the time this series is over, you guys are going to be saying this in your sleep. But here it is. It's Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, doesn't matter what it is, whatever you do, because God made you to do something, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as if you're working for the Lord and not for men. Man, whenever I got saved, man, and I started getting plugged in with Brian Bolt's church, man, I was working for God. Like, yeah, I was under the banner of City Reach Church, and I was under the banner of Brian Bolt. But, man, I was serving Jesus Christ, my risen Savior, who changed my life. Amen. So whatever it is you do, do it with that enthusiasm that you're working for Jesus. Because let me tell you, there's nothing like working for him. If I sleep in and I'm late in the morning, he doesn't get mad, but he shows me grace. Whatever you do, get excited, man. Do it with your heart because it's for him. No matter how much you do for Jesus, It'll never be more than a speck of what he's done for you. Right. How good is that? You know, maybe, maybe you don't know him the way that I know him, but guess what? Even if you don't, he's still going to bless you just as much as he blessed me because he is no respecter of persons. Amen. Man, you, you saw how messed up Nate was. Man, look at him now. This is what Jesus does. Man, he had nothing. He wanted to kill himself. He stopped another people from doing it now. This is the God we serve. You know, he's real and he'll meet you right where you are, man. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're going to get struck by a lightning bolt or a Brian bolt. God will reach you, man, and he will love on you. That's what he does. So I always tell people, Pastor Nate is my armor bearer. And a lot of people are like, well, I don't understand what an armor bearer does. So in the Bible, there's these guys that would go behind kings or commanders, and they were armor bearers. And here's what they do, man. In scripture, an armor bearer was a servant who carried additional weapons for the commander. 
You know, they, they also were responsible for killing enemies wounded by their masters. Man, how many know that when you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to have the enemy on your life. And this dude's going to try to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, and I stand up there, and you know, they call God's word the sword of the spirit. So I believe every time I step out in the trenches and I declare what Jesus has done, and I preach the gospel, I wound him just a little bit more. But I praise God that I have a man who has my back that will come up when that wounded soldier gets up to come and stick me in the back. I got a guy that's going to hit him with a sledge. Boom! Right in his head. So I praise God for my armor bearer. Now, I believe everybody needs an armor bearer, man. Not just pastors, but you know what? When you're following Jesus, the enemy doesn't like that. You know, the enemy liked Nate better when he wanted to kill himself. Oh, yeah. Tell me, you know, that's a fruit of what he does. But man, Jesus steps on the scene and he changes everything. So a little bit more about the armor bearer. After enemy soldiers were wounded with javelins and arrows, armor bearers finished the job with clubs or swords. Couldn't you just see Nate up there with a big old club just pounding and pounding? That's what I love. I'm a big dude. I probably don't need a bodyguard, but I'm glad that I got one. <laughs> you know, armor bearers were considered to be very loyal and trustworthy, and they would fight to the death for their commander. There's not one more loyal person in this world than Nathan Carr. Doesn't matter what's going on, this dude has my back. When I had nobody, he was in the trenches with me. That's what a good armor bearer does. Even though you're going into some hostile territory, he's going to have your back. And in the modern church, an armor bearer essentially serves as the church leader's bodyguard and will throw themselves on a grenade to protect their pastor. And how many know if somebody comes running up from the back with a shank, coming at me? Now, Mind you, I have these nice six-pack abs, so it'll probably bend. <laughs> but how many of this dude would throw himself in front of a shank for me? That's the kind of man Pastor Nate is. So that, that's what the armor bearer does in the modern church, is he's like a bodyguard that would jump on a grenade. And you know what? He wouldn't just do that for me. He'd do that for you guys, too. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. If you're going through something, this guy will jump on a grenade to help you. You know, he's like Bruno Mars. Who stepped on a grenade for you? <laughs> I'm not looking to take your job, Lisa. I, I know that I got that pastor swag, but... <laughs> that was just wrong. So another one of my... Uh, another uh, scripture I want to bring up about Pastor Nate would be uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Now this is Jonathan. He was King Saul's son. And um, this is him talking with his armor bearer. So verse 6 starts out, let's go across to the outpost of those pagans, Jonathan said to his armor bearer. Perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. Let me tell you, there's nothing that can hinder Jesus. Amen. He's all powerful. He's all sufficient. Everything we need is wrapped up in him. He can win a battle whether he has many or only a few. You know, so, I mean, it can be me and Pastor Dan. It can be all of us. Let me tell you, it's all of us. We can do some damage. Oh, yeah. But here, here's the best part. The armor bearer goes, do what you think is best, the armor bearer replied. I am completely with you, whatever you decide. There was only a couple of them, and they're going into a big battle. You know, the enemies around, it had to be scary. Imagine this scene. And, and Jonathan's like, I think we can take them. You know, I, I could just see myself talking to Nate, like, dude, I think we can do this. And he's probably looking at me like, this dude probably just smokes some crack rock. <laughs> like, what is going on? Like, but the armor bearer's like, look, whatever you decide, I'm with you. You're going into a battle, you're going to get slaughtered. Guess what? I'm going to die on that hill with you. Because I believe in you. No matter what is going to happen, I'm in it. I'm in it to win. I will go down with your ship, even if I disagree with, with your command. That's what an armor bearer is, man. He's somebody that is so in it to win it that even when he's losing, he's still in it like he's going to win it. That's what Pastor Nate's like, man. I, I thank God for him. So I've got a few takeaways. You begin to be used by God. How you can be equipped. You just need to showcase Christ's work in your life. Because, man, even if you haven't been walking with him all that long, he's done something magnificent 
because you're not going to hell no more. Amen. He's done something so good because he took something that was defeated and brought him to victory. Man, he didn't need to deflate no balls like Tom Brady, but how many know, man? God is up to something. You know, not just in New Kensington, but all over the world. So how are you going to showcase what he's done in your life? It's like I said, man, when you follow Jesus, there's something that's so appealing about your life. You know what I mean? There's something that people are going to see like, that dude's not the same. Right. This dude, Andrew, he saw the other day, he's like, you ain't the day car I know. <laughs> so many know Jesus makes that change. Amen. Amen. So how are you going to show that change? That's what I want you to think of. Because every single one of us, whether you've been serving him 60 years or 60 seconds, there's a change that happens right. when you encounter the risen Savior. We don't serve a dead God that's trapped in a tomb. Man, we, say, we serve a God that busted the rock off yes. the tomb. Yeah. What tombs you need to break out of, man? Let's get excited, man. Yeah. Jesus yeah. changes things. Yes. And I'm fired up about that. Amen. Amen. My second takeaway is see the need wow. to be the solution. Wow. Man, we got a whole bunch of kids that are on drugs, having sex, pimping themselves out. Yeah, right. Pastor Nate saw a need. He said, you know what? We could use a youth pastor. These kids need somebody to tell them about Jesus so that we can take this generation, get them on fire for God, yes. and put the enemy to shame. But how many know that that young generation is a generation that kids look up to? So when they see these guys serving Christ, man, they're going to be like, there's something cool about this Jesus guy. You know, because I grew up, man, I was dragged to a Catholic church, and I always saw the Jesus that was like, boom. You know, you look like such a dork. And I'm like, you know, there, there's something. You know, maybe when I get old and I'm about to croak, I'll get on board with this Jesus stuff. But you know what? Yeah. When I met him, he's the coolest dude in the world. Amen. You know, I used to think the Bible Amen. was dorky. I read it, man. That Bible is the most swagging book there is. Amen. Jesus is like the coolest dude. You know, so we need to represent like he's the coolest dude. Man, you see a need, you be the solution. Because how many know, man, God has a plan for your life. Right. You're all here for a reason. He's just waiting for you to plug into your reason. And I don't know what that is. You might not know what that is. But let me tell you, God knows what that is. And my prayer is that you would realize what it is God wants to do in your life. Because, man, he is so great. Every single day, man, I wake up, his grace and his mercy is new. I'll tell you, man, there's days that I feel like I can't even function. I'll get to get a little taste of Jesus. Oh, man. I feel like Red Bull, man. I got my wings. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, man. He is so good. So then that comes to my last point. Is that be faithful with a little, and God will give you much. Man, whenever I first started working for Jesus, you know what my job was? I was the guy that would walk around the sanctuary and talk to people. My job was to make sure people felt comfortable. It's just so naturally I do. You know what I mean? I'm just one of those people that have the personality that I flock to people. So that was my job. Pastor Brian would be like, look, here's the attack line. Don't love people. <laughs> <laughs> I got that. You know, so like, I, and I felt like it was important. You know, so I'm just going, hey, what's up, bro? You know what I mean? Do like my little swagger handshake and all that. And that's what I did. And I was faithful with that. And when you're faithful with a little bit, God will give you much. You know, at the time when my job was just to love people, I never thought I'd be playing the church. But I mean, no, when you're faithful with the little things God gives you, he's going to give you more. Yeah. You know, like I, I'm sure Pastor Nate never thought that he would be a pastor. Like he said, that's still weird to be like, hey, I'm Pastor Nate. Because he remembers what the old Nate was like. And you know what? He was faithful just being a Nate that didn't do drugs anymore. You know, then he was faithful with the Nate that would come and run tech at a church. Then he was faithful with the Nate that went over to Africa. And you know what? Every single time he was faithful, God added more onto his plate. You know, and God takes those humble people who are faithful with whatever they get, and he exalts them. You know, we're going to be playing a church here in a couple weeks out in Cumberland, Maryland. Woo! And it's with uh, yeah! Stevie Grills and Hollywood. Woo! And these guys were like Bonnie and Clyde of like drug dealers. They were on tour of the Grateful Dead. And man, they both went to jail. They were living crazy. So they're both in jail. Stevie gets saved. He starts praying for his wife. Holly gets saved. And you know what? The desire of Stevie's heart was, when I get out of jail, I just want to be a janitor in church. I'll clean the toilets. So he got out and he got plugged into a good Bible preaching local church. 
And he was happy cleaning the toilets. That was his role. He was faithful with the toilet cleaning. Man, he had a bald head. People probably thought he was Mr. Clean. And it's crazy. And he's scrubbing these bowls. And then the next thing you know, God starts giving him more. Just like Pastor Dave, there was a need for a youth pastor to reach the kids. So him and Holly stepped up and they started being the youth pastors. And the next thing you know, man, in just a few weeks, they're going to be launching a life giving church in Cumberland, Maryland. How awesome is that? And that's the God we serve. He will take the ex-convict toilet cleaners of the world, and he will use them to change a city for Jesus. So what's he going to do for you, man? Get excited about this, because this is the God we serve. Not one person is disqualified. I don't care what you've been through. We've been there. If you're a part of City Reach Church leadership, you are probably one of these people I'm talking about. But God will take the foolish things of the world and use them to confide. 